Good morning and welcome to John Calvin Presbyterian Church. I am Casey Waite, the pastor at John Calvin. It is a beautiful day today as I'm recording, but I'm guessing as you are watching this that at least if you live near the church, you will be inundated with snow. And so I pray that there's peace and quiet that accompanies that snow for you. A couple of brief announcements this morning. Alexis Kasim of Little River UCC, United Church of Christ, will be joining us as our guest preacher next week as the final in the series of Good Neighbors Proclaiming Together. We are excited to hear her voice and to welcome her in our midst. So don't, don't miss that. Be sure to join us next Sunday. And today, on Sunday, January 31st, we have the Interfaith Communities for Dialogue event on Systemic Racism in Healthcare and Housing. It's an extremely important topic, and I hope that you will register and then join us from four to six. If you can't be there, it's definitely worthwhile for you to be there during that time, but if you can't, please consider watching it after it is completed. I hope to see you there on Zoom. Although we cannot uh, share a chili lunch together this year, that does not stop us from supporting the ACA Food Pantry through our Super Bowl. That's S-O-U-P-E-R. We will accept donations at the church on Sunday, February 7th, between noon and 2 p.m. And if you have not participated in this tradition before, the idea is that each item or dollar will represent one vote for your preferred football team. This year it is between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Kansas City Chiefs. If you love Tom Brady, if you hate Tom Brady, if you're indifferent toward Tom Brady, at least we can be uh, not indifferent. What's the opposite of different? It's, uh, we can be focused in on, on feeding those who need to be fed at this time. Checks should be made payable to JCPC with Super Bowl on the memo line. You can even give online and just make sure that you write Super Bowl in there and those checks will go to ACA. And as always, the, the real winner of the Super Bowl will be the food pantry. So that's on September 7th and I am thankful for Marsha and Paul Farabee for uh, their willingness to, to be there to do the collections and Marsha's planning of this event. Uh, we do it every year and we will miss the chili together and for my children hiding under the tables, but we will do it as we can. We'll make sure that people get food. Ash Wednesday is coming up, believe it or not, on February 17th. There will be a service. It will be online, of course, and I hope that you will join us the evening of Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. Now, as we prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls for worship, we begin once again with silence, creating space to just be, we are on the fourth chapter this week of Liturgy of the Ordinary. Its title is Losing Keys, and it is, once again, a way we are trying to be present to ourselves and our God throughout our day. We begin this by sitting in quiet.
Praise the Lord, who is our provider. The Lord is our hope. Our trust is in God. God brought us out of bondage and has made us free. The Lord is our hope. Our trust is in God. Glorious are the deeds of our God and mighty are his acts. We come with praise for the wonderful works of God. Let us worship God. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We're together on the road. We are here to help you. In her book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, Tish Harrison Warren says this, Our failures or successes in the Christian life are not what define us or determine our worth before God or God's people. Instead, we are defined by Christ's life and work on our behalf. We kneel, we humble ourselves together, we admit the truth, we confess and repent. Together, we practice the posture that we embrace each day, that of a broken and needy people who receive abundant mercy. And so let us approach our God as ones who know of God's love and mercy for us. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we have been wandering in the wilderness of sin. We've complained in the face of your mercy. We have been selfish and conceited in the face of your sacrifice. We have not done your will. Teach us humility. Teach us gratitude. Infuse your spirit into our beings so that we might be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. She goes on to say, And then what a wonder! The word of absolution. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. When we confess and receive absolution together, we are reminded that none of our pathologies, neuroses, or sins, no matter how small or secret, affect only us. We are a church, a community, a family. We are not simply individuals with our pet sins and private brokenness. We are people who desperately need each other if we are to seek Christ in walk in repentance. If we are saved, we are saved together as the body of Christ as the church. This is good news. We not only receive God's mercy and forgiveness, but we are recipients of God's peace and we are asked to emulate that peace in our lives and with one another. 
We practice that every week, saying peace be with you and also with you. And so I invite you to speak it aloud wherever you are, peace be with you and also with you. And then at some point today, text or email or call and make a connection and an offering of God's peace to someone else. Oh God, fill us with your spirit and humble our hearts so that we can hear your word. Amen. Paul sent this letter to the Corinthians from jail. And we have, uh, we have worked through a little bit of this letter before, previously this year, but it bears repeating. Listen now for the words from Philippians 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, we dealt with Tish Harrison Warren's third chapter, which was about how we understand ourselves, how we love ourselves, how we look at ourselves and understand our being children of God and trying to love ourselves with the love that God has for us. That's at least the way I interpreted it. But today's chapter, chapter four, entitled Losing Keys, Confession and Truth About Ourselves, takes a turn. It was 
almost jolting this time around as I was reading this book because I had spent more time between uh, the first chapter and the second chapter. The first time I read it, I read it through. It, it felt jolting having, having worked so hard to understand what self-love is or what, as we talked about last week, radical self-love in light of our belovedness and God might look like, and then to, to turn around and to follow that up with a chapter on confession and forgiveness and brokenness. I've been trying to figure out, is it that my theology is, is different than her theology that as an Episcopalian? Is it that I don't want my people in this time of real struggle to get worn down with reminders of our brokenness. It seems to me we're being reminded of that regularly. We as a people come together and confess every week because we do realize that our actions affect one another. Our inaction affects one another, either for good or for ill. We gather together each week to try to figure out how we are going to be an intentional people, the intentional body of Christ. The confession, the call to confession, the confession, the assurance of pardon when we are forgiven are probably the most important pieces to keep in worship in my mind. Others would disagree with me and probably I would disagree with myself in a couple of days, but, but I think they provide for us a model that we do not, especially in 2021, have in our society regularly. We practice each week saying that we are imperfect, saying that we are in need of forgiveness, standing humbly before our God or sitting, or maybe some of you during this time kneel. We don't kneel in the church when we meet physically in person, but maybe you are kneeling now. Maybe you will try it next time. We remember that we are dust and to dust we will return. We remember, we remember, we remember that we are human and still blessed. We live in a country in particular where there seems to be some hidden contract that we, we want promises all the time of things that people can't actually fulfill, especially from our politicians. We want strong people leading us. Apology is somehow seen as weakness. We're not allowed to follow the Maya Angelou, when we know better, we can do better. Because there's some assumption that if we were really good enough, we would have just been better from the beginning. So when Tish Harrison Warren talks about our frustrations with ourselves, how we can move in and through and maybe even overcome the daily grumblings or how we can invite Christ into that space. One, I think it's really important and two, it's something that we need to wrestle with. Most of us, when we lose our keys, or many of us, I should say, I don't know how your brains work, but my brain works a lot like hers. When I lose my keys, and I even have one of those little tile things, this little square thing you attach to your keys so that if you lose your keys you and you can find your phone, your phone can find your keys. Um, the only thing is you have to actually like sync the two things, and I've never actually done that. So my phone can't help me find my keys, but I have a very nice, and it was a gift, but probably decently expensive uh, keychain now. I can't even remember 
to do the thing that will help me find my keys in the event that I lose them again, which I will probably when I'm trying to get home from here. Y'all, I have lost my keys by mistakenly burying them in our, column bear, in, our, in our memorial garden. I am the master of this. And the accompanying thoughts are very similar to Reverend Warren's. Mine would be something like, you lost your keys again. Why can't you just be more organized like everybody else? My thoughts will converge around this sense that I should feel ashamed. Because if I just tried a little harder, if I was just a better person, I would know where my keys were. If I could just get my life together, think. If you would just do this, if you cared more, that's the worst one. If you cared more, you'd know where your keys were. So those are the thoughts that come up in my mind and then the accompanying feeling is the shame. It's this shame piece about ourselves and about other people we interact with because sometimes it's not us who have lost the keys, it's somebody else in our family who had them last and all those things may go on, but about somebody else. It's not the thoughts themselves. We can separate ourselves from those thoughts. I'm not dumb. <laughs> I am not irresponsible. But unless we do that separation, we'll move to the feelings of shame. I hope you're, you're still with me because I actually think this is really, really important. It's the shame piece that belies our brokenness not the losing the darn keys. That's not a sin, that's not a thing. Um, I think that's why I struggled with this chapter because I'm not sure that she, um, or at least I couldn't conceive that she was fully identifying with those small actions not being sin themselves. I think of sin with a big S in a much larger uh, way than I do when it comes to losing keys in my theology. In my head, yeah, I assign blame and shame to myself or to someone else. Here's where that connects for me with repentance, with confession, and with our need for humility and forgiveness. God does not want shame for us. God does not want us to see our imperfections and get so overwhelmed with blame and shame that we no longer can function in the way God calls us to function, that we are paralyzed by our own self-doubt and self-recrimination. When we practice week to week saying that we are sorry, saying what we want to do versus what we do, and that there is a difference between those two things, saying that yes, we miss the mark and we want to be on track again, asking for God and our community to hold us accountable, when we do that, we are simultaneously inviting ourselves away from blame and shame. We are simultaneously inviting our neighbors to move past blame and shame, to just acknowledge that we are not going to get it right all the time so that we can get down to the work of God's work. Yes, she emphasizes the repentance piece and the sanctification and the being willing to state that 
we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there are things that we have done and things that we have left undone every single day. That there are ways that we behave that might represent the worst of us. She says at some point that she thinks that they, uh, when she reacts that way to her keys, it shows some hidden brokenness. But I would push back on that a little bit. I think it shows her humanity, but not an innate brokenness. The brokenness is in believing that if you lost your keys, there's something wrong with you. And she identifies the the brokenness there is her sense that she should have control over everything. Which I think is what a lot of us are feeling right about now. God gives us grace before, during, and after. God's mercy is for us before, during, and after our confession. God already knows. When we confess, we join God. We make ourselves ready to receive God's grace. We prepare ourselves for that. We acknowledge that we don't have control. And all the while, God is with us. When Paul was writing to the Philippians, he, as I mentioned earlier, wrote to them from jail. He wrote to them, encouraging them to seek unity and be of one mind. He wrote to them, encouraging them not to be overwhelmed, consumed by your grumbling. Do all things without murmuring or arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent. Good luck with that. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to use sarcasm in sermons, but here we are. Uh, Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. He wrote about joy and unity from captivity. He wrote about the kind of deep joy that comes to us, not from getting everything we want or doing everything correctly, but in finding peace with our God. And in these times when we are more apt to be short-fused and grumpy because we feel this loss of control, because we are lonely, because we are anxious. We will trip and fall, but we will do so being held by God. May God's mercy and peace and forgiveness and hope and joy be with you this day and every day. Amen. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your faith. Oh, uh-huh.
hands, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, who is ever present, you hear our cries and are ever faithful in your mercy. We come to you with our concerns for ourselves, our community, and the world. For our church and its leaders, fill them with the spirit and mind of Christ so that they would serve you and others well. We pray particularly for our session and our committees, that in this time of pandemic disorientation, we would find clarity and purpose in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our global community and our country, enable our leaders, all of them, to make decisions for the sake of the people and not prophets, to serve others and not themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local community, praying especially for those who are housing, food, and job insecure in our midst. We give you thanks for those who seek to meet immediate needs, especially for our partnership with ACCA. And we give you thanks for those who seek long-term solutions and pray we would be ones to advocate for such change. And we give you thanks for the work of Voice and their community organizing to help people stay in their housing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer with sickness, sadness, bereavement, anxiety, or abuse, envelop them with your love and help us to be their community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the other intentions we hold in our hearts, we now pray in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we know that you walk with us and you answer when we call. With gratitude and trust, we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The works of the Lord are wondrous indeed. Let us offer back to God a portion of what has been given to us for, for the, the glory, glory of, of God's, God's name. name. O God, use these gifts to do your will in the world. And prepare us for your coming kingdom. In, in Jesus', Jesus name, name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Love the Lord and serve others for the glory of God. And may the God who is always near bless and keep you on your journey. Glory, honor, and praise be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen. <laughs>